Well, I just want to say good evening to everyone. It is just uh, an incredible honor to speak before all of you guys. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Douglas. What? So it, it's it's pretty interesting. We're going to continue on the study on 2 Timothy chapter 2. Oh. Come on. And, and so um, not only am I preaching, but I have the privilege and the honor to preach alongside uh, my roommate slash best friend. Oh. Oh. And so uh, it, it's just going to be a joy. It's going to be pretty fun. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I love how we're recording. Amen. <laughs> but uh, if you can turn your Bibles to First Pe First Peter chapter two. Mm. So right here, uh, it, it's it's crazy. When I when I was reading the the, pat the verses that I was going to be uh, sharing on, uh, that I was going to be preaching about, I noticed something uh, very uh, interesting. Is that when in Peter um, he has a very parallel message. Uh, in this time, Peter is preaching to the disciples in Rome. Now, now what, what is he preaching about? Uh, we're about to find out. But in this time, uh, I want us to understand that this is a time when Christianity was considered despicable. Uh, what is that? In other words, it was considered, considered something like a stench in society. Wow. And, and with that, you know, it, it really goes to show the turmoil that all the disciples undertook. So we're going to continue off here in 1 Peter 2, starting verse 4. And the Bible says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who's, who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone, the people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. It's incredible to see that Peter, he, he's addressing something that, uh, that lacks in the discipleship, uh, just community, in the kingdom of God. And, and what he's really referring to is that we don't really understand who we are. He really points out that, yo, guys, we are of a royal priesthood, mm -hmm. that we are a part of a holy nation. We are not from this world, that we are foreigners in this world. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible that all these letters, so coming from uh, First Peter, coming from Peter, and also Paul, who wrote the book of Timothy, that it's the same message preached all across. Mm -hmm. And what they're preaching about is that you, we have to understand our true identity. Mm -hmm. And that is the title of my short uh, sermonette or my short charge is your true identity. Mm -hmm. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Come on. My first point is simply, I know who I am. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2, and we're going to start from the beginning. Verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by, by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Mm -hmm. Reflect on what I am saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Mm. So we're, I, I like to uh, simplify things. It just makes things a lot easier to understand and everything. But it, it's incredible that we see Paul. He, he, he really has three scenarios right here. Mm. So he, or as a matter of fact, three practicals. First practical he points out is that we are a soldier who doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs. Someone who is uh, uh, loyal to their commanding officer. Second one is an athlete who competes according to the rules. Yeah. Third one is that a hard-working farmer mm -hmm. should be the first to uh, receive a share of the crops. 
You know, some may say, may imply that uh, he's really referring to the logistical things of how the kingdom should function. But I think Paul is, is speaking about on something a lot deeper than this. And sometimes uh, as disciples, we can actually miss that. So if we can just uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, just so that we can transition um, a lot quicker. Matthew 25. So in, in the second Timothy scripture, Paul at this, this time is in prison and writes to who most uh, would call his right hand man. Paul addresses the characteristics that lack in disciples and uses Timothy as a vessel to prevent uh, to prevent and to call out what is in rebellion to the gospel. One would have implied that he's fo focusing again on the logistical aspect, but we're going to look at this on, from a heart level. And so the first thing he addresses, he says, entrust to reliable people. You know, when I first read this, I, I thought to myself, what is a reliable person? And what better way to see what is, uh, who is someone that is reliable, but through the biblical uh, uh, approach, the biblical meaning. So in Matthew 25, verse 24, we see here uh, in verse 24, Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. Mm. You scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has, who, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they will have will be taken from them and from the worthless servant outside in the, into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we see a biblical teaching right here. This is Jesus speaking to the apostles, to the disciples, and he's, he's uh, speaking on a parable. So uh, for those who don't know the parable, the parable is basically, um, uh, is, is there's three servants. There's a master. He gives uh, three uh, servants a certain amount of bags of gold. And the thing is that the first two, what they ended up doing, they were able to uh, double up the amount of gold that they had. But the last one, it was a whole new different story. It was a different story for him. What had happened is that he didn't take what, what, what he was given uh, with a huge amount of gratitude. And I think that's something that really defines someone who is reliable. Mm -hmm. It's not someone who can uh, like follow the rules or do what is being told, but to do even greater things. Yeah. And I think that's something that Jesus sees in all of us. Those who, who make the decision to obey Jesus, but to go and make disciples, we're going to do far greater things through Christ. Yeah. And it's just incredible just to see that even Paul himself, he's over here preaching to, to Timothy. He's writing a, a letter to him. And he sees something that is, is sort of drifting away from amongst all the churches. And it's the same thing that Peter preaches to all the disciples. Mm -hmm. And as disciples, we're supposed to grow to live for others and not to grow and to invest in ourselves. Wow. Now, I'm not saying to abstain from investing in ourselves. What I'm trying to say is that we really got to check our hearts individually. What are, why do we do what we do? Mm -hmm. Why do we give for others? Is it out of uh, insecurity? Is it out of uh, self-image? Is it out of just uh, doing the bare minimum, but knowing that deep down in our hearts that we don't want to obey? Come on, Dad. And it leads to uh, my second point. What makes me who I am? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is interesting. If we can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that this is another letter that Paul is, is writing. It is uh, also parallel to the letter that Peter wrote. And in this letter, he's addressing the disciples in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 5. Come on. And we're going to start here in verse 13. Come on, Dougie. It says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Yeah. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died themselves, but for him who died, who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in, in Christ, the new creation has come the old has gone. The new is here. All us, the ministry of reconciliation that God has reconciling, 
was reconciling the world to himself and Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We reconcile to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of okay. God. And, and right here, we see the, the, the message being preached the word, and we are molded to change. Peter reminds them in his letter, and Paul does the same by reminding them of the pressure of Christianity. Mm. You know, sometimes when we think about uh, the pressure in Christianity, sometimes we can refer to uh, persecution from mom and dad. We can refer to finances, to uh, the hardship in, in our assignments in school, mm -hmm. even in relationships. It's, it's incredible how people um, be become so self-inflicted of the relationships they have in life. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that the pressure that we need to be uh, feeling for ourselves is just the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the word compel, defined, is to be... Hold on for one sec. You got Doug. this, Doug. Do a great, bro. Amen. So right here, compel just means to, to abstain, uh, uh, not abstain, to receive pressure. And what it does, it causes us to change. Mm -hmm. The pressure Paul is referring to, it's, it's, it's not something of authority. It's not something that is outward, but it's something that's inward, but it's compelled by the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. Pressure merely from the love of Christ. For if we embrace the love of Christ, we embrace the new identity Christ has given to us. Wow. When we proclaim Jesus is Lord. The love of Christ is supposed to pressure our hearts to change for Christ and to be filled with joy. Christianity should not be a burden. Wow. Christianity should not be something to where it is an option. Christianity shouldn't be something that pushes us away from God. Mm -hmm. It is a lifestyle. It is a, an identity that we have to live by. And this is something that Paul and Peter constantly share throughout Galatians, throughout Ephesians, and even just preaching to the, uh, the disciples in Corinth, and also Peter preaching to the disciples in Rome, that we cannot forget about our identity. Wow. And, and going back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, mm. referring back to verse uh, 3 and 7, right here, he, he gives three, three practicals. But he doesn't want us to be so focused on, on what is, is there. You know, you have an athlete, you have a farmer, and also at the same time, you have a good soldier. But what he wants to really say to us is that we have an identity as disciples. Mm. We are not supposed to give in to the world for, well, we're not a part of this world. Yeah, he, 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 he sets a standard. He could have said uh, a farmer who does moderate work. He could have said a soldier who listens to only a few things. But the reason why he points this out is because we live differently wow. from the world. Yeah. And, and this is something that we got to reflect for ourselves. And as a matter of fact, it's a challenge I want to give for all of us. What does the death of Jesus mean to you? You know, one, one thing I, I really do appreciate, um, this one time um, I had a, a D time with, with Sean. Uh, I'm definitely grateful for him. And as a matter of fact, all the brothers. And, and something they, they constantly uh, said to me was to, to take myself back to the cross. Uh, one thing that I ended up doing was just doing the cross study with myself all over again. And that, that's something that is so humbling. It, 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 it astonishes me that the fact that I've, I've forgotten about the cross. Mm. In the same sense, reflect in your quiet time so on what the death of Jesus means to you. But when was the last time you spoke about it? When's the last time you shared that when you were sharing your faith? When's the last time you shared your testimony on how much the love of Christ had compelled you to be a different person? Mm. Come on, Daddy. As a matter of fact, to, to compel you to be a whole new identity. Wow. And with that, you know, it's crazy because what the death of Jesus it does, it moves us to a new, uh, a new face on earth. It moves us to a new uh, person that we live for Christ. Mm -hmm. And to take it even further, sometimes we can feel as if we're not worth to die for. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my third uh, short point. You are worth dying for. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 again. Oh Instead, God. we're going to start here in verse 8. So this is the second half of, the, of uh, my portion of uh, chapter 2. Come on, Dougie. Verse 8, the Bible says, Remember, Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect 
that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for that he cannot disown himself. Mm-hmm. Paul shares right here where he, he does all of this. Not only did Paul uh, perceive that the fact that, you know, Christ died for him, but he also perceived that Christ died for all of us. It, it, it's crazy. Just when we think about the kingdom, it's not singular. I, sometimes we can think that our relationship with God is just, is just me and God. It's just right here. What, when, when we forget is that the true meaning of the kingdom of God, it, it's actually around us. It, it surrounds us, and, and it's something that we, we cannot forget as our true identity. In the end, despite how many times we mess up or how much faith we lack, God still remains faithful in his love. Interesting enough, in, in the last verse where it says that um, when we're faithless and that he remains faithful, the meaning of faithless is just to be without faith or disloyal. Ooh. It's not that, oh, when we have a little faith. It's not that when we are, we're only loyal in, in certain areas. It's when we're completely uh, abstained from all of this. That God still remains faithful. Wow. Look at the Israelites, for example. God came to a point of compassion and love, even with their disloyalty. Uh, a story I want to look back on. Um, it's actually a familiar scripture in Isaiah 53. If you can turn with me, uh, if you have your Bibles out. In Isaiah 53, so this is a scripture that uh, we, we actually share uh, a lot uh, in the cross study. Uh, there's a series of, of studies that we do uh, with individuals to help build their relationship with God. And, and this is a, a scripture that I think uh, really resonates with me. Uh, it really brings me back to the cross. Uh, but we're going to start here in verse 4. Surely took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, 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 right here, there, there's there's two characters uh, reference right here. It, it's it's us and him, uh, and it's Jesus that it's prophesying about. And right here, this is what what Jesus basically did for us. He took up our iniquities. It, it, it's just crazy to really think and to really fathom, but that's what compels us to change. Christ took up our iniquities for the sake of us being one with Him. You know, the Hebrew translation for, for will is, is, is pleasure. You know, it's one thing I, I, I really think about. So I grew up in a Catholic background. And one thing I, I've, I've always uh, grew up, the idea that I grew up with, you know, looking at the, all the statues around the, uh, the chapel and everything. You see this, uh, this statue of Jesus Christ and he's looking down and it's like, he's like guilt tripping you. You, know, you guys ever un- mm. have that feeling? <laughs> like you're just looking at a, a statue of Jesus and it's like, oh. My bad, Jesus. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and it's just like something where it's just like, it, sometimes we can have this idea that, that Jesus is guilt tripping us. But what we forget is that Jesus had joy in doing this. Yeah. He had joy taking up the wow. cross and dying for our sins. Mm. And that's something that we really got to really destroy. Just this negative light on, on our, our Lord. Mm. And, and right here, sometimes we can look at our relationship with Jesus under a negative light. Um, where he, it's almost as if he's guilt tripping us. Uh, is uh, my older brother? Uh, his name's David, and I remember growing up. Uh, so my brother always had a lot of toys, and I was always the guy that's like cherry picking off of all his toys. And so <laughs> um, there's this one uh, toy truck. Uh, it had a remote control. I, I thought it was pretty cool back in. Amen. But anyways, <laughs> mom got me a, a toy truck. It had a remote remote control. And so my brother wanted to go play with it with his friend, so I let him go. I, I, he gave me the, the controller to the Xbox, so I was pretty fired up. <clears throat> but anyways, um, with that, you know, he ended up breaking the truck. And with that, I was just like, man, I really love that truck, but I think I can get something uh, even better uh, out of my brother. And so, of course, me and, and, and my uh, foolishness, uh, I guilt-tripped him. Wow. In, in, in the same sense, uh, sometimes we, we feel like 
it, Jesus, why, the reason why he did it is to make us feel guilty and for us to obey him. But that is not the truth. Truth is that, that Jesus found joy in bearing the cross. And with that, you know, it, it's something that uh, we got to get excited about is just that, as a matter of fact, it's something that we got to allow to compel ourselves is to really move into change. Jesus fought so hard so that not only we will make Jesus our Lord, but also make Jesus our Savior. Mm. So I just want to ask you guys, like, who is Jesus to you? I think it's something to reflect in all of our quiet times. That includes myself. It's just, who am I to Jesus? And I think something like this can really show our reflection upon our relationship with God. Like, you're, like you are worth dying for. And, that, that, you know, just uh, point number one is just knowing that, that who we are. You, you have to know who you are. And this is something that Paul preaches constantly, that Peter as well. Even throughout the Gospels uh, with, with Jesus, how he's trying to mold these men because they are different from the world. And at the same time, what makes me who we are? And knowing and understanding that we are worth dying for. Thank you all, and to God be all glory. Come on.